I got this book for Christmas called Rediscovering Jesus. And um, it's done really good things. And uh, I just want to read this real quick. It says, it was the biggest meeting of Paul's life. He had, it had gone well. He couldn't wait to tell his wife and his boss. As he rushed out of the Brooklyn office building with the rest of the team, they noticed a vacant cab, a rare sight at rush hour. Eager to get to the airport and catch their flight home, they bolted toward the cab, yelling to get the driver's attention. But as they made their way across the sidewalk, they inadvertently knocked over a small produce stand. The rest of the team seemed oblivious until Paul stopped and turned to go back. From beside the taxi, the others called, Paul, Paul, come on, we're going to miss the flight. Go on ahead, go on ahead without me, Paul replied as he made his way back across the street toward the sidewalk covered in produce. At that moment, he realized that the woman who had been behind the produce stand was blind. She was just standing there softly crying. It's okay, it's okay, Paul said, as he got down on his hands and knees and began picking up the fruit and vegetables. There were hundreds of people passing in each direction, but nobody else stopped to help. They just scurried off to wherever they were going. When the fruit was all picked up and put back on a stand, Paul began neatly to organize it, setting aside everything that was of no use. Now he turned to the woman and said, are you okay? She nodded through her tears. Then he reached into his wallet, took out some bills, passed them on to the woman, saying, this money should cover whatever damages. With that, Paul turned and began to walk away. Mr., Mr., the woman called. Paul paused, turned back around, and she asked, are you Jesus? Oh, no, 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 I, he replied. The woman nodded and continued. I only asked because I prayed for Jesus to help as I heard my fruit falling to the sidewalk. Paul turned to leave, but now his eyes were filled with tears. Long after time had wandered, he went back to the taxi. He found one. After finally finding one, he sat in bumper to bumper traffic all the way to the airport and missed his flight. It was a Friday night, and all flights were full. Paul spent the night in the lobby in a hotel near the airport. This gave him time to think. He couldn't get one question out of his head. When was the last time someone confused you with Jesus? So I was thinking about that, and I'm going, we live in this time of, of hyper opinions. Everything is hyper opinionated. You're pro this, anti that. You're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you're a liberal, you're a conservative. You're all of these things. But in all that hyper-opinionation, we become hyper-judgmental. That's the problem with having strong opinions. They lead to strong judgments. And James says that in James 2, and I know it's one of Pastor Rick's verses that we think on sometimes and more than we should, or more often than we should, is the one who shows judgment without mercy to that person will have no mercy shown in judgment. And so a lot of times we start thinking in these, in these processes that this person believes this, so they have to be this. And if they don't believe what I believe, they're wrong. And the judgments are passed and the judgments are cast. And we forget that when Jesus came in his first advent, Jesus wasn't a politician. Politicians hated him. And he wasn't a general, but the real generals feared him. He didn't come to saber rattle. He came to save and to serve. Amen. And sometimes that gets all convoluted. It gets clouded in this, this time and, and history that we live in. Everything is cut and dry. You're here or you're here. You're here or you're here. And like I said earlier, if Christ was here, and he is because he's in us, guess where Christ would be going? Everywhere. Everywhere. He didn't have his predisposed judgments because if he did, he would have never left heaven. Because you have to think about it, folks. 
He's up there with his father going, I'm going where, for who, and do what? <laughs> no. We, we, can you imagine being the Lord looking to this place from heaven, and you want me to do what for them? And that's basically what I do. Lord, you want me to do what for who and when? And he's going, yeah, I do. I do. So what we're going to do today, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 9. And have you ever noticed that uh, chapter 9, verse 6, have you ever noticed, and I don't know about some of you in here, you, we, we talk more about sports Politics, global warming, uh, who's running for president, who's president, who ain't president. We, I mean, how much of our time, seriously, is my time spent on that each day compared to, did, I, did someone see Jesus when I came today? Did someone see Jesus when I spoke today? Did someone see Jesus when I acted today? Like I said, I don't know, you know where we all work and all. How, I bet you there's not a person in here, when you go to their job, say, is this guy Republican? Is this guy Democrat? Is this guy liberal? Is this guy? They're probably going to all know our politics. They're probably all going to know our favorite sports team. They're going to know batting averages, how many passes somebody completed, how many yards they ran for. But if they went there, they would say, when's the last time Dave mentioned Jesus here? Isaiah chapter 9. And basically what we're going to be doing is just, like I said, it's a re re refocusing and, and a reevaluation of, of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 9. And for me sometimes, we only hear this verse at Christmas. It's on everybody's Christmas card. Right? For unto us a child is born. And that's true. God came and he was born of a virgin in his humanity and took on flesh, right? Born like every man of the flesh except born of a virgin in his complete humanity. But the thing with chapter 9, verse 6 is, unto us a son is given, right? Isaiah 9, 6, then unto us a son is given. And when you get that at Christmas, it's always at Christmas time. So I say, unto us a son is given. It's like a pair of socks, you know, a shirt, a tie. This, this gift from God, right, a son is given. And we, we kind of get this attitude, well, I'll do it like a pair of socks. Eh, I don't really like them. I'll stick them in a drawer. The tie doesn't match anything. I'll, you know, put it in the trash next time nobody's looking <laughs> That's the problem with putting that verse together at Christmas. A son is born, a child is born, and a son given. What we have to look at is that word given, okay? In the language, the word given is the word nathan. And it means not just to give, but to place or to put. So when the son was born, in Galatians 4, it says, in the fullness of time, right, God sent forth his son. His son came to this place called earth for a reason, right? He was born of a woman, a virgin, under the law, so that he might redeem those under the law, so they might receive sonships, okay, adoptions as sons. So what God is saying here is, when Christ was born, he was set in place, not like a sock, not like a shirt, not like a tie that we have an opinion about that we can pick and choose what we want to do with him. When he was born, he was set in place. Amen. What does that mean? Turn to Genesis 1, 16 and 17. We're going to see the same word. Genesis 1, 16 and 17. We'll see the idea of what... the what scripture is saying when we saw the son be put in place. Genesis 1, 16 and 17. Then God made the two great lights, 
the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light the night, the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. Verse 17, God, Nathan, he set them in place in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. Just as he set the lesser star and the greater star, he set them in place. Where are they at right now? They're still in place. They are still in place. And his son, guess what, is still in his place as the gift of the Son of God to man. Amen. Not this thing that comes and goes, it's on a time limit, it just you know, starts here and ends there. As the stars and the lesser lights are set in heaven, so is the Lord set in heaven. Go to Genesis 9 real quick. Genesis 9, 13. It's just, I love it when he just shows us who he is and just says, my goodness. Okay, Genesis 9, 13. We know Genesis 9, the Noah, the flood, and all of that, right? But after the flood, there was a rainbow. Okay? We'll start at verse 12. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I have made between me and you and every living creature that, is, that was with you for perpetual generations. Verse 13. I, Nathan, I set the rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and earth. How long was that Nathan of that rainbow for? <laughs> for all time. For all time. Until Christ comes back and there's a new heaven and a new earth, there will always be a Nathan rainbow in the clouds as a covenant. That's the establishment of the Son. Right? Okay. He is established, and he's not going anywhere. He's reigning forever as the stars in the firmament and the rainbow in the clouds. Okay? Let's go to John 3.16. I don't know if you remember, because we said after time we lose, forget 10% like five minutes after we heard it. But this was all back when Rick talked about Henry Moorhead and Moody about John 3.16. Moody, he and Moorhead invites himself to Moody's church. Moody's not there. He preaches sermon after sermon on John 3.16. Moody's wife says, I think you're going to like this guy because he tells sinners that God loves them. Moody goes, I'm going to have to wait and see on this guy. Right? So Moody, he's preaching. Moody comes back, hears me, he goes, Moody said, it changed my whole way I looked at preaching the gospel. Wow. And Moorhead on his deathbed said, if God would raise me up, my text would be, God so loved the world. John 3.16. And so this is one of those verses where we see it, we all have it memorized. Memorized, but okay, here's no saber rattling, no Democrats, no Republicans, no anti this or pro that. A son of God who came to do what he came to do. Amen. For God so. So. You know what that so means? To the infinite degree. We can't pass over the so. He so loved the world to a degree that we can't, com we can't comprehend it. Because somebody slights me, says the wrong thing, and I've already written off my list. God has not written any off his list. We choose not to be on his list. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. For God so loved. And we all stopped there. Agape and he loved the world. Oh, yes, 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 he loved. When you finish that, he loved the world that he gave. Gave. Love without giving is no love at all. None. It might be wishful thinking. It might be a road with good intent. But if it's love, and that love is not giving something, it's not love. Friendship, it's whatever you want to call it. But God's agape, true love, gave, gave his son. And it's interesting, that word gave is the word didomai. Didomai. It means to give, again, to give, to bestow on someone. But here's what we have to catch. Didomai, to give of one's own accord with good 
will. When God sent his son, he's going, <laughs> it's like Jonah. Okay, they're going to get saved. Now God let these guys in heaven and all on, on it. No. God, of his own free will and of good will, sent his son. <coughs> sent his son. We have to get that, guys, or else every time we go to do something, why do you think in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God's scripture says, God loves a cheerful giver? Why? Because God's a cheerful giver. Yeah. Amen. He ain't going, oh, let me give you this blessing. Oh, oh. And we, we arm wrestle for it. I don't want nothing. When God blesses, he opens his hands. He lets go of the blessings. Yeah. Freely does he give. Freely, freely does he give. What's the example? When I go to give something, it's like, ah, don't give it. Keep it. Seriously, friends. If that's the heart of the issue, keep it. It does no good. It does no good. We have to give with the heart that the Lord gave with. Of, of his own accord and of his freest of will. He gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe should not perish but have everlasting life. One author puts it this way. Love may not make the world go round, but it makes the journey more enjoyable. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. It may not make the love go round. But on this journey, if we love, it will make the journey more enjoyable. Amen. We can go through, I can go like kicking against the goads and saying, you know what? If they were just more like me. If they just, and that's a, that's a scary thought. <laughs> that's a scary thought. And from, from this way, that way. That's a lot of scary thoughts, right? We don't want to be like me. We don't want to be like us. We want to be like Jesus. We need to be. And that's the thing. We don't just need to be like Jesus. We have to long to be like Jesus. It's like sing our, you know, let our life songs sing. It's not easy to sing all the time. And to be like Jesus, to have to want to be like Jesus and act like Jesus acted, that's not really on anybody's hit parade most of the time. Why? Because it costs. It's true love. It is giving something. When Jesus sent his son, right, in, in Galatians, sent forth his son, what else, what, what more, what more did the father have to give? Do you ever think, what more did he have to give? There was nothing greater he could have given than his own son. And he sent them. And he sent him. God loves a cheerful giver. Let's, real quick, let's go to Luke 2, 22, 19. When you're there, just say Amen. It's, it's, a, it's a familiar verse, 22.19. Luke, 22.19. And he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is didomai. Same word. Given a free will and a free conscience for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he was, what, hours away from the cross. From the cross. And I'm doing this of free, free will and of my own accord, that whoever should believe should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it, hopefully it's... it's for me, like I said, I've been journeying with this thing for about six weeks. And like we were saying, when in, in James, in the second chapter, when 
when you go to that, that mirror of this word, and that's what it is, that's what he says, and I look at it, and I think everything is hunky-dory, and I leave the mirror, and I walk away thinking nothing needs to be changed, I fool only myself. Because every day, so many times a day, that we would let God take us to this mirror, guess what? It's for our own good. It's for our own benefit. Because if I'm being more and more made into the image of God, that means more and more of the old me is leaving and more and more of the new me is growing. But I have to, have, I have to be truthful when I look at myself. And the thing is, like it also says in, in James, when we go before, right, and we are judged by that royal law, right, that, that law of liberty, John 5.5 5 says this, these commands are not burdensome. This book is not burdensome. It's freedom. Amen. The more I do the things that ask me to do, the freer I become. The freer I become. The more I try to hold on to and keep from doing, guess what? I'm still that much of a prisoner of those things. When Christ came, he had a tunic and some sandals. That was it. That was it. What else were they going to take from him? There was not much more to take. Let's go to John 10.45. I'm sorry, Mark 10.45. It's another... It's another well-known verse. Okay, we're there. Mark 10.45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be deakoneo, served, right? But to diakoneo, to serve. He did not come to this earth to be served. He came to this earth to serve. Not to rattle sabers, not to pick parties, not to become a Pharisee or a Sadducee or whatever. He came as the Son of God to serve. To serve. He came to serve and to give. Guess what that word is? Didomai. That's why we're, that's why we're, all of these words. Didomai, didomai. Came to serve, to give free willy and out of no compulsion except that he loved us. He came to give his life of ransom for many. Not to run for office, not to win a popularity contest, not to do any of these things that we live in this society or in this world that deems important. Not one of them was important to Christ. The only thing that was important to Christ was the next saved soul. Period. Period. It says, and it's interesting, daikoneho, it means to serve and to wait upon with the emphasis on the work to be done, not the relationship between the Lord and the servant. That's You have to, the emphasis is on the work to be done, not the relationship between master and servant. The Lord didn't care what your position was. He didn't care how low your ranking was or how high your ranking was. He didn't check your credentials. He didn't look at your bank account, how much was in it, or how if nothing was in it. He came to serve. When we were on the streets for all those 10 years, it was interesting. We were there to feed the homeless, and we did. But there were people that would pull up in cars, right? And there were people that would have motor. There were people that just weren't homeless. And so we'd get a little bit of, not really a confrontation. Some of the folks would say, well, these people aren't homeless. I said, you're missing the point. I said, I don't care if somebody drives up here in a stretch limo, gets out, 
and asked, what are you guys doing? I said, what we're doing is giving chili dogs root beer floats in the name of Jesus. Would you like one? I don't care. I tell them if you land a Learjet on Daisy and Walnut. No, I don't care how you get there. You're there for a reason. I don't care your status. Neither does the Lord. You want a hot dog? You want a chili dog in the name of Jesus? Come on up to the table. Amen. We're serving whoever shows up. And that's where God, you know, I, I already got my standard. When I see somebody, maybe some of you, when I see somebody walking up to me, I'm already going, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I'm sizing this guy up before I say, you know what? Jesus loves you. My job is not to size anybody up. My, size, my job was to say, the Lord loves you. He came to die for you, regardless of how much you have or how little you have. He loves you. And that's one of the things that God's been showing me in my mirror. That I, I, don't, I don't need to know what position the person is in. I don't need to know what his philosophy is. I don't need to know who he's going to vote for. I need to know if he has come to know Jesus. Because if I don't cut all that stuff away, you know how many people I'll be talking to Jesus about in a day? None. Zero. Because nobody will fit my little definition and my little cutout of what a Christian or what a person that needs to hear Jesus looks like. It will all be run through the filter of what I think they should look like. Instead of running through the filter of Jesus saying, he's standing in front of you. The one I need you to talk to, I don't care if he's got an Armani suit or if he's been sleeping under a tree. Talk to him about my son. Amen. So it's not about position. It's about our purpose. So... One author writes, greatness is measured by the yardstick of service. Greatness is measured by the yardstick of service. Like we're paying anybody, I'm sure most Christians, they, they work and they go, oh, I'm kind of getting tired of this. I've been doing this for three months. I've been doing this for five years. I've been friends. And I, so what? Whatever we have to do, the Lord was preparing himself for 30 years. And all his preparation and goodness and work and all the loving and mercy and everything he did for 30 years got him what? A cross. And the, and the Bible says, do not be wearying in your well-doing. And he knew, he knew that was going to be his reward. But he said, great is my reward. He understood that. I have to come to understand that, like that. What, what's, gonna, what's the payoff on this? I teach high school. I teach this. I, I make soup. I, you know, we wash dishes. We make coffee in the morning. What's the payoff? The joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, Amen. the fellowship of the Lord, and a heart that God knows he can use to expand, to maybe do more for the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We're done in the New Testament. <laughs> now we're going to go to the Old Testament. Actually, we're not done in the New Testament. <laughs> no, actually, we're not. Go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. This is chapter, Gospel of John, chapter 13. And we're familiar with the chapter, okay? If you look at, at the end of John 13, the first chapter, it says, he loved them to the end. To the end telos, to completion, to perfection. In that period of time that Christ was here until he departed, there was no more 
way he could have loved those men and those around him any more than what he did. There was no more he could do. There was no more he could say. There was no more he could show to them than what he showed them. Loved them to the end. He's still loving them, but what he was about to show them is that my end is just about here. And I'm going to love you to, up and to that point as much as I've ever loved you in this whole time we've had together. Now this is, this is the Last Supper, right? Okay, look at verse 4. And we're going to be kind of skipping around, but we're going to, we're going to be all right. Verse 4. Keep in mind now, in the East, the, me, the most menial, menial, menial of slaves washed the feet. And Jews weren't forced to wash the feet. It was a Gentile who had to do these things. Okay? Keep in mind, we have to get in our mind's eye what's happening here. This is, this is the Christ. This is the one who, in Isaiah said, a son will be given. Nathan, set in place. Right? This is that son. This is the son who came to give his life for the ransom of many. Okay? He rose from the supper and laid aside his garments. Now, the supper, when they washed the feet, they didn't wait till we're all sitting at the table. They were washed as they came in so they would be clean at the table. Okay, so are you getting the picture? He rose from the supper and laid aside his garments. Okay, son of man, son of God. We're talking Jesus. They're, they're sitting at the table, reclining at the table with stinking dirty feet because the Son of Man, the Son of Man, who they should have been fighting and falling over themselves to wash his feet. In Luke 22, we're still arguing who's going to be the greatest in this kingdom. So great were they that when the Master was sitting there, they all sat there with their feet dirty until the Son of Man, the Son of God, set in the heavens, got up from the table. Are you, they're sitting there. The water pitcher was there. The basin was there. The towel for, all the utensils were there. What was missing was a servant's heart. They were waiting for the slave to show up. Who's going to do this? I'm, not, I'm going to get the left, and I'm going to get the right, and if I'm lucky, when you're on vacation, I'll fill your chair. Is that not our thinking a lot of the time? I'm going to wait for somebody to wash somebody's feet. We're not saying that feet washing is a sacrament. It's what we're going to get to as far as humility. So Jesus, Jesus laid aside his garments. Okay? And I'm not trying to be... That would be like if Pastor Rick and I were here giving this message and we decide to go down to our skivvies. Okay? That would be humiliating. That's what Jesus did. He took off his garments to his undercloth, his loincloth, and girded himself in the long towel that he could bend down and dry their feet. He laid aside his garments. And I can't lay aside my opinions. I can't lay aside my yardsticks of judgment. And the Son of Man, the Son of God, came into that room and waited for the servant to show up, and they were all arguing about what they needed to cling to. So finally the Lord said, I'll get up. And divested himself of his clothing and took the position of the most menial slave and washed their feet. And Jesus tells us, he goes, look, you don't even have to go that far. How about giving someone a cup of water in my name? How about that? How about a cup of water? How about praying for somebody? Let's start with the stuff that's not going to break the bank. Hey, have you ever, did you ever notice when, read scripture, have you ever come across anywhere where Jesus gave anybody money? Most times, friends, when we're going to come and be called upon to give, it's not going to be monetarily. 
And if it is, what did, what did Jesus say in Mark 12? When they scolded the woman, she's doing what she could. All God is asking any of us to do is do what we can. If everybody just did their piece, guess what? The job's done. We start that, but that's what I'm saying. We get so clouded. We want to be the one that pulls out that checkbook, six digits to the left of the decimal. It's got to be this thing. God says it doesn't have to be that thing. But that's the putting aside of me to become more like Christ. Christ is just saying, help. You ever notice this? He says, help. He doesn't say how much. He just says, help. What's the help? Most times it's going to be encouragement. It's going to be grace. It's going to be hope. It's going to be helping someone move. It's going to be lifting something. It's going to be sitting down instead of yapping. It's going to be listening. These are all helps. These are how we help. Verse 5. After he poured the water into the basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he had girded. So he started to serve. And did you notice? Nobody. Jesus just stood up to wash their feet. Who jumped up to say, I'm sorry, Lord? Nobody. 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 So they're all still just sitting there waiting for the slave to show up. But guess what? The true servant showed up. And I believe... Just like in this room, there are many, many, and I shouldn't say many, I should say all, because everyone in here is called to what? Serve. serve. To serve. So we're not going to go through the whole thing with Peter. We, we know that. You're not going to wash me. If you don't wash me, you have no part. Read that part on your own. Okay? Verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, now... Guess who was still there when the feet were being washed? Judas. Judas. You mean Judas, the guy who was in? Yeah, that Judas. That Judas. What does that show us? I, I have no parameters for whose feet and who needs to be helped. I'm not saying that if Jesus would have done something else, Judas would have not, because we already know that Satan had already entered in. But that person who is having that kind of thoughts or living that kind of life, when they see that kind of love, we have no idea what can happen to that person. We have no idea what can transform a person's life. So when he washed their feet, he put his garments back on, sat down again. Now they're all still there. And he said, do you know what I have done for you? And we know that Jesus died on the cross and we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior and we're saying, do you know what he has done for you? Truly? Do I know what he has done for me? Truly. We can't comprehend it this side of heaven. But we have to get a perspective of the greatness of the thing that he has done for us. Every day it slips away from my mind. He had just done it. He had just washed their feet. The, the Lord of heaven and earth was standing before them. The one who had calmed the seas, that he had seen him do all of these things. Multiply the loaves and the bread and give sight to the blind. And he goes, do you know what I've just done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, and so I am. I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have. And that's the title, our great example. We see these things like washing of the feet, and we're going to go, I'm not going to wash anybody's feet. Well, if I'm not going to, and that was a sign of, what was the sign? What was the example of humbling yourself to the position of being the lowest slave and doing the work that that lowest slave would do. That's, that's, all, you know, that's all he's asking of us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But he gave himself as an example. That word means something to be followed. 
This wasn't done in a vacuum. These are the disciples. And it wasn't done in a vacuum because it's right here. We have it. What do we do with it? Amen. Okay, now we're going to go to the Old Testament. We're going to look at some Proverbs. Proverbs, we're going to look first at Proverbs 19.17. Right? Amen? Proverbs 19.17. You there? Proverbs 19.17. He who has pity on the poor... And when we see that word poor, instantaneously our mind probably thinks somebody doesn't have enough money. All it means is someone who is in need. It doesn't matter what the need might be. See, because if we, that's what we do. What I want to do is like, oh, that guy needs some money, so, you know, somebody will give him some. I'm done with it. No, that might not be what the person needs. What the person might need that's in front of me is what I have that Lord knows I have that that person needs. So we have to expand our view of what someone might need and what we're being called to do. Right? What did Jesus do? He fed, he healed, he comforted, he did all of these things. But he didn't give anybody because that's no help. It's temporary. And if God gave him money, then what are you going, what's that person going to think? Oh, I need some money. That's what I can depend on. This is what I need. Not the person who's standing in front of me, but that person who's going to be here. This can go buy some grain or something. No. Least and least and least of the things that we're talking about is money. So he says, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. Interesting word. The word is lawa. Right? And it means, it means, this is interesting, to join, to accompany, to attach oneself to someone or something. When I give to the poor, when we lend, when we help the poor, I am accompanying, I am attaching myself to the same thing that our God would do. Not separate and apart from what God would do. I am joining in the work of what God does. Which is a wonderful thing. When you think about it, when you help someone... When you help someone, God is right there. You are attached. You are like joined at the hip. You're not helping. We are helping. We lend to the poor. We help the poor. God and I have now become one joint endeavor to help. It's an amazing thought. It's an amazing thought. But he... It says, and he will pay back what has been given. There's some incentive. <laughs> you know, what do, I, what do I get out of the deal? Well, guess what? You will get back whatever you have put in. And to the measure, it's Luke 6. Okay? If I, if I give forgiveness in the name of Jesus, guess how kind of, what kind of, what's, Pastor, what kind of forgiveness am I going to get? Pressed down, shaken, overflowing. He's not going to do it. If I give love, if I give whatever I give, it is going to be returned to me. That's not the reason I give. It's the reward for giving. We give because Christ gave. We give because Christ gave, but in the process, Christ says, as you give, guess what? I'll be like Rick said a couple, we'll be God's the debtor to no man. What you give, guess what? Into your lap. <clears throat> Praise God. So we can't be afraid to give. I don't have it. Give, and guess what? See, we'll get it. <laughs> Amen. It, it, this is his uh, commentary from the mid-19th uh, century, Reverend Benson. He says, the Lord takes what, the Lord takes what you give to them, as you was given to himself, right? Because he is appointed, and this is interesting, because he is appointed to his own stead, some to be receivers, and in some, in manner of, I just can't, even, some manner of, oh, commanding to give and to put in their charge to come 
the charity of all other men. So basically, there are people who need help so that we can be in Christ the ones who help. Right? They're the recipients. We can give. Why? Because reality is we've all been recipients of God's grace. Amen? Okay, we're going to go to Proverbs 11.25. Proverbs 11.25. The generous soul will be made rich. The generous is in, yep, 1125. The generous soul, generous, some Bibles may have liberal, right? It means good favor bestowed. The desire of my heart has to be, like the desire of Christ's heart has to be, is to be one who bestows good favor. That was always on his mind. You might, you might not want it. You might not believe me. You might follow me just to get some bread. But his desire was what? To bless them, that they would come to know him as the bread of life, the water of life. That was his heart. They will be made rich. Some of you in your Bible will be made fat. That means bones growing fat. It's a sign of good health. You cannot give to the Lord and for the Lord. And I'm not saying everybody's going to be in their bodies healthy, but your spirit will be fat. Your spirit will be well. Your spirit will be growing. Amen? And we're going, to end on, on, we're going to end this and then one thing. And it says, and he who waters will also be watered himself. <laughs> Two different words. The first water, and it's really interesting, it's ra'ah, to give, to water, to drench. So it's like when you come to somebody, right? He who waters, it's like, oh, I think that's enough. To him who drenches the one who needs help. The one who comes to that person and just does everything he can. It's like the woman with the alabaster jar. Broke the top of that jar and poured all of that spike nard on the feet of Jesus and the disciples went crazy, some of them. But you know what? That woman knew that I can break that jar and pour it all out because God's word says tomorrow every mercy is new. Pour out what God gives you today because tomorrow he's going to refill it. I don't have to worry about it. Break the jar. Whatever am I holding on to, pour it. Find someone. Drench it. Your wife, your kids, whoever. And just drench them with the grace of God. And what does it say? And he who waters will be watered himself. Yara will be poured. If I drench someone, God's going to pour that on me. I, I, um, the other day was my birthday, a couple days ago or whatever. And um, <coughs> thank you. And the thing that hit home to me was, for years, I didn't, I didn't believe in watering, whether by the drop or by any. I just figured it didn't matter. Well, lately, in the past few years, I've learned that watering is um, imperative, that watering works. Um, you all know my daughter, Molly, right? Pray for me that I can get through this, because this is a result of learning to drench and to see the pouring that comes back. She says, happy birthday, Daddy-O. She calls me Daddy-O. <laughs> Through the past 26 years, you've shown me how 
a real father is supposed to be. You brought our family together, and your strength and faith has held us together. You have shown me how a woman is supposed to be treated and loved and respected by the way you respect mom. Thank you so much for all the laughs, cries, hugs, words of wisdom. I am blessed and proud to have you as a dad. I love you with all my heart. Happy birthday, Dad. Now, I could have chosen not to water when it was time to water, but my choice was to water, and not by the drop, but by the drench, and it's paid off in being a daughter who has poured out a card into her dad's heart. So all we have to do, friends, is not to be afraid, whether it be a drop at a time, because a drop at a time will turn, turn into a torrent. One drop, one drop, one drop, and pretty soon there's a, a river of life flowing not just through me, but to those who come in contact with me. Amen? Amen. Amen.